Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Well, welcome to the Armor of Faith, a show where we hope to bring our listeners closer to the Word of God and the blessings we receive through living in the fullness of the Catholic faith. My name is Doug, and I'll be your host as we discuss the blessings of the Church Christ built upon Peter. And I'm joined today by my panel, which includes Helen Hawkins, as well as Sister Sarah Draney. And Sister Sarah Draney is a Dominican nun from the Monastery of the Infant Jesus in Lufkin, Texas. Helen is a lay Dominican and has a love for music ministry. Uh, The Dominicans, I should mention, are also known as the Order of Preachers, so they suit us very well here on the show. Sharon uh, is uh, out today. She's uh, under the weather with uh, influenza. Um, But as everybody knows by now, I'm simply here to ask questions, because that's the one thing I learned how to do when I was two, and to answer my questions and correct my pronunciation of biblical names, because I sorely need it, is why we have our panelists. So welcome to our panelists, as well as to our listeners. Let us open with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we lift up our hearts in thanks and praise for this opportunity to open and share your holy word this day. We pray that you are with us and all our listeners as we share with one another the blessings of faith. We pray you will grant us wisdom and understanding as we seek to learn your holy truth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray, amen. During our last discussion, we mentioned that prayer is a conversation with God. As with any relationship, time together is important to the quality and blessings which may be shared and to maintain a strong bond. God calls to us and is ready to hear our prayer at any time and at any place. The choice is to the time we spend with him, he has left with us. As I mentioned, some people may be like I was, praying only in desperation. For a long period of my life, I didn't really know how to pray or what to pray other than the occasional cry for help. <clears throat> Excuse me. God is certainly there for us when we do cry out, but he also wants to hear our joys, our questions, our thoughts for our future. He also wants to give his love and reserve eyes in return. These are all things we can do through prayer. Just as time and practice was required for us to learn how to communicate with those who surround us, we cannot learn how to communicate with God if we do not spend time with him. It may feel uncomfortable at first, but as we allow ourselves to grow in prayer, we will eventually find that we become more uncomfortable when we do not allow ourselves the time to spend in prayer. Note that I said, when we do not allow ourselves. So while there are many demands upon our day, if we look, there is always time to pray. It does not take that long to say, dear Lord, I love you. If there is nothing else we have to say for the day, That short prayer speaks volumes. Today we're going to talk about a special place for our prayer, and that is during adoration of our Lord and Savior in the Blessed Sacrament. Though it should be a priority for us, it appears to be a fading practice. Those, however, who awaken to it find adoration to be a special time and an opportunity to allow Jesus to speak to our heart. So, We know the word adoration, and I'm sure many of our listeners spend time in adoration and receive its blessings. But let's take a moment to reflect upon what it is and what it means. Well, let's start by asking, what is adoration? And why would God ask us to spend time in adoration of his only begotten son? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, um, it's uh, probably unique to our faith because we not only believe in the incarnation, but that God really hasn't left his, this world in a physical sense. He is still with us. So it is really a uh, privilege to be able to, um, to go and to actually spend time in front of God, who is present uh, physically, uh, and uh, and so doing that, um, I think many Protestants have said uh, that if they believe the same thing that we believed about the Eucharist, they would fall flat on their face and 
And uh, so I think that many of us maybe take it for granted. Uh, but just pondering the reality of what the Eucharist is um, is a real motivator, I think, to understand why God gave us this sacrament and why it's such a, a good practice to go every now and then to um, to actually be there. Uh, it, it's quite a blessing to have God physically present and not just in a spiritual way. So one of the things that we might note in the Catechism of the Catholic Church in paragraph 2096, it says, adoration is the first act of the virtue of religion. To adore God is to acknowledge him as God, as the creator and savior, the Lord and master of everything that exists, as infinite and merciful love. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve, says Jesus, citing Deuteronomy. And, of course, if we then follow what Jesus was citing, go to Deuteronomy first, uh, chapter 6, verse 13. It reads, the Lord your God shall you fear, him shall you serve. And I should note here that there, if you go into the footnotes at this point, uh, the footnote into the verb that is used for serve as they translate it kind of has a dual meaning. It says both serve and worship. So it says, him shall you serve and therefore also worship. And by his name shall you swear. In par uh, paragraph 2628, you're also told that adoration is the first attitude of man acknowledging that he is a creature before his creator. It exalts the greatness of the Lord who made us and the almighty power of the Savior who sets us free from evil. Adoration is a homage of the spirit to the king of glory, respectful silence in the presence of the ever greater God. Adoration of the thrice holy and sovereign God of love blends with humility and gives assurance to our supplications. <coughs> So it's, a, it's an opportunity, if, if we put it to its simplest terms, it's just an opportunity to spend time with him in his house, not just spiritually, but physically. I have to uh, ad uh, admit to uh, my own um, lack of going to and being part of adoration I have several times in my life. Part of that is having been a Protestant, adoration and the Eucharist has something that I have fully accepted mentally and spiritually, but still it is not something that I feel deep in my heart. And I, I feel like, um, like, like uh, Sarah said, uh, if 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 we really if Catholics and Protestants actually recognize fully what the Eucharist is and what it means, we would fall down in absolute love for for Christ at adoration. And so much of this conversation, I'm going to to uh, have. Sarah talk about because as a nun, she she has been much closer to the meanings and and the necessity of adoration. And I will probably learn an awful lot now from her and from you on this subject. And you know, it's one of those things that as you mentioned there, Helen, that we we can sometimes take for granted. Um, but if you think back at the time when Jesus was walking amongst the people, how they thronged to him. And yet we have the opportunity to throng to him ourselves. And, and yet um, there are many things that distract us from accomplishing that. So it's something for us to, to think about a little bit. If we have the opportunity for adoration, to think about that it is really an opportunity for us to, to spend to spend time with someone who loves us more than, I mean, he is the example of love. He is, he is, he is love incarnate, um, but he is also the one who created us. So 
Let's take a look at paragraph 333 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And here it tells us, from the incarnation of the ascension, the life of the word incarnate is surrounded by the adoration and service of angels. When God brings the firstborn into the world, he said, let all God's angels worship him. Their song of praise at the birth of Christ has not ceased resounding in the church's praise. Glory to God in the highest. They protect Jesus in his infancy, serve him in the desert, strengthen him in his agony in the garden. When he could have been saved by them from the hands of his enemies as Israel had been. Again, it is the angels who evangelize by proclaiming the good news of Christ's incarnation and resurrection. They will be present at Christ's return, which they will announce to serve at his judgment. <coughs> and indeed, if we look at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 to 6, it reads, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, this day I have begotten you. Or again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And again, when he leads the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. So when Christ was brought into the world, the angels rejoiced. So who else came to worship Jesus while he was in swaddling clothes? What might we reflect about their story and what drew them to the child Jesus? Well, I think um, that uh, it was unique in the sense that um, Bethlehem was the first time that um, Gentiles came and marked the presence of, uh, they, they acknowledged uh, a God that, um, that was probably unique to them. Um, there's a tradition that maybe they were descended from the time when Daniel was in Babylon, and they think perhaps, well, maybe those people had never left uh, Babylon because they never left Babylon. So they think that that is why these people were interested in following the star to begin with. But it just marks the whole, the beginning of the new uh, gospel, and um, which is a very groundbreaking event, of course for all of time. So um, in that sense, it deserves a great deal of respect and um, remembrance and, and uh, worship. So, um, so in that sense, we can also think of that when we go to adoration, that this is the very core of our belief, is the incarnation. Uh, otherwise, we would not have Christianity. So... Um, uh, so when we go there, in a sense, we're reviving our the, the whole meaning of our uh, faith. Um, yes. It was, it's interesting to know when we when we look at this paragraph of the um, uh, paragraph three thirty three of the Catechism that it uh, it says from the incarnation to the ascension. The life of the word incarnate is surrounded by the adoration and service of angels. And so when we go to the infamous uh, nativity narrative, and particularly when we look into Luke uh, chapter 2, verses 8 to 20, we hear these words that, um, you know, I'm sure most everybody has, has heard at some time or another. And it reads, Now there were shepherds in that region living in the fields and keeping the night watch over their flock. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were struck with great fear. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Behold, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you who is Messiah and Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find an infant wrapped in swathing clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels went away from them to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go then to Bethlehem 
to see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. <coughs> so they went in haste and found Mary and Joseph and the infant lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known the message that had been told them about this child. All who heard it were amazed by what had been told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things, reflecting on them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told to them. Almost kind of in a way, we might see this as perhaps maybe the the first opportunity of adoration, if you will. Um, And it was the shepherds in the field that were drawn by the angels to this opportunity. That that's a really good um, analogy. You know, I'm just thinking here. We we can be just doing our daily chores and doing what we have to do and picking up kids or or grocery shopping and all of that. And something would call on us and say, you know, drop what you're doing. You can't drop kids, of course, but uh, many of the many of the chores. You can, and just take the time out of your life to go sit and, and, and contemplate what it is that you are seeing and, and feeling and doing in the, in the presence of God. Um, it is a definite uh, Catholic concept that... I think is is greatly misunderstood by most of us. Yes, and and one of the things that um, probably often comes to mind in that is is that we we do have a lot of demands on our day, but there is also a voice that's calling to us. And and think of the number of times we think, oh, geez, if I just had a little bit of quiet, if I could just get all the noise out of my head if I could just have a little peace. And yet that's exactly what we can have if we take the opportunity to go to adoration. Yeah, the few times that I have, have done adoration, uh, the, 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 it, is different, it is a different silence than being in an empty room, uh, which is actually an empty silence. But when you're, when you're there with people, and we are all silent, there is a certain communication uh, that is quite mystical I, I'm, uh, because we're all there for the same purpose. We are all very respectful of each other in our silence. We don't tend to intrude on the people who are there, but at the same time, we're not excluding each other. We're just all there for one, one purpose. You would think I would go more often, um, considering how, how much I appreciate it. And, 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 and that type of silence that you experience that is not, not empty and not lonely and not sad. There's another group that I'd like to, to bring to everyone's attention um, that we see in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. And here we're told, When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it's rising and have come to do him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was greatly troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it has been written through the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, and by no means least among the rulers of Judah, since from you shall come a ruler who is a shepherd, my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and ascertained from them the time of the star's appearance. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligent for the child. When you have found him, bring me word that I too may go and do him homage. 
After their audience with the king, they set out, and behold, the star that they had seen at its rising preceded them until it came and stopped over the place where the child was. They were overjoyed at seeing the star. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They prostrated themselves and did him homage. Then they opened their treasures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their country by another way. And, and of course, as we know by later scripture, Herod didn't really want them to find Jesus so that he could do him homage. He wanted him to find Jesus so that he could he could fill the Christ Jesus. And, uh, um, and of course, we, we know the dark side of that story. But I think what's interesting to note about these magi is the distance that they traveled just so that they could come see this child and that they brought him gifts as, as a result. So when we also think about how far do we have to travel, now it depends on where we're at in the world, but if we have to be near a Catholic church, we, can, we have that opportunity to spend time with him. So as we discussed, the Magi offered to the baby Jesus gifts. So that kind of brings to mind, what gifts might we bring to adoration of our Lord and Savior? Do we have to bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh? <laughs> uh, well, in a, in a sense, we do, because um, uh, first of all, I think just our presence is... Um, Part of what we talked about last time in prayer, our presence with and our, rela- our furthering of rela- our relationship with God is probably the most important thing. Whether And I think it's important whether we get anything out of it or not. Sometimes we might get uh, distracted or um, it might not even... Uh, feel good for us that particular time, but just as in a marriage uh, relationship, for example, um, you know, uh, sacrificing something for your spouse, even when you don't feel like it sometimes, does uh, send a message of love to the spouse. So it's the same thing with God, that we're willing to do this for God and to uh, give him our worship in that sense. So in that sense, frankincense has always been a sign of worship. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the myrrh has always been a sign of Christ's suffering. So we can also talk about our own sufferings um, and just laying them out before God, anything that troubles us. Uh, uh, and I think just um, expressing those in our prayers um, is a tremendous amount of satisfaction to us. We may not get a lightning bolt answer at that moment, but I think it's a very good um, way of dealing with suffering is to deal with it right there with your God. So, um, And then um, our our goal is always representative of uh, um, eternity and especially Christ's eternity, but... uh, I think also, you know, it, it causes us to think about uh, putting things in perspective, what happens to us every day. Can We can think about, you know, um, how to live our life better, how to make better decisions. Maybe we're struggling with a decision. Um, we can bring those to adoration because that will uh, affect our uh eternal life, especially our spiritual decisions. So, um, you know, so we can bring those gifts in a certain way, but I think the most important thing is just the gift of our ourselves. Uh, I think that um, does a lot. So when we, when we think of, of that, when we, you know, when we come to adoration, you don't, you don't see piles of of uh, gifts around uh, the altar there, but there are a number of gifts that are brought to the altar through the prayers of of those who do come to adoration. And we can bring in our prayers examples of our obedience, and we can also bring examples of of our our doing for others. 
through our prayers, we can also lift up our expressions of our love. And that in and of itself is, I mean, as we exchange love with one another, we're exchanging the gift of love. We can also lift up our prayers of thanks and praise, as well as our desire to repent from our sin. That's probably the greatest gift that we could we could offer and lay at the altar, as well as our penance. And ultimately, as, you, as Sarah mentioned, when we do those things, when we bring our prayers, when we communicate, when we establish that relationship that we can have, have with Jesus, we're also giving him the gift of us. And you might think, well, that sounds arrogant. I'm giving the gift of me when he created me. Um, and I don't mean it in that sense. Uh, I mean it in that he gave us free will, and through our free will, we're returning our love. And that, as we receive his gift of love, we're returning that gift to him as well. So it, it's all, a, all an excellent opportunity for us to, to be able to spend that time together with him. Let's take a moment and look at Luke chapter 10, verses uh, 38 to 42, and it reads, As they continued their journey, he entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat beside the Lord at his feet listening to him speak. Martha, burdened with much serving, came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving? Tell her to help me. The Lord said to her in reply, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her. So in this passage, we observe two women, one who chooses to sit at the feet of Jesus and the other who set about serving those present. What message might this have for us as we choose the priorities of our day? That story is one of the most fascinating stories. And I, um, between two sisters and, and between women, and the messages that come from that story have been debated, I think, for the last 2,000 years about what, what it means to serve Christ, to sit at his feet, and what it means for, especially for, for women, but also what it means for men, too and what God is expecting of us. And uh, I love that story. And um, I think we sometimes forget that we can be busy, 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 and, and, and forget that we are to love first. Do you think Martha was wrong for serving those present, for making them comfortable? No. No. I love- Go ahead, Sarah. You think Jesus was telling her that? No, but uh, generally, if we're if we become so involved in our work, um, it's bad for us because we lose uh, our rooting as human beings. Basically, we're not just computers that are meant to function. Um, I think. Uh, I think the point is that, uh, and especially going to adoration helps too because it reminds us that even if we are like Mary, we have to keep um, our focus on uh, the spiritual uh, priority of why we're actually here, which is not just to be successful in a career, but to be um uh, fruitful in this life spiritually and ultimately in the next life. So uh, I think adoration helps us to put aside for a while um, and to appreciate uh, that deepest vocation of human nature and of the spiritual focus we need to have in order to co- sort of maintain control, too, over our lives. I think sometimes we lose sight of that, and once we start maybe implicitly thinking that it's our power, uh, a lot of our daily work becomes a bit frustrating. But um, if we can keep a focus that that's not the ultimate reason we're here and not our ultimate goal, those things can be put in the proper perspective. And I think adoration 
reminds us of that, at least to take time aside to appreciate um, uh, the true thing. And that, in turn, helps us to handle our lives better. And I think the thing that he was communicating is that there's a time for everything. <clears throat> and there's, there's a time for serving, but there's also a time for listening. And in this particular case, when the master's present, <laughs> then maybe this is a real good opportunity for, for listening. And so Mary chose that at, at that part here. So it wasn't, it wasn't that Martha was, was wrong for wanting to serve, but we also have to consider the moments we have and then consider the priorities of those moments. And sometimes we can, we can get our priorities a little bit backwards, uh, if you will. Another example we might look at is Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 to 46. And it reads, Then Jesus came with him to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to feel sorrow and distress. Then he said to them, My soul is sorrowful even to death. Remain here and keep watch with me. He advanced a little and fell prostrate in prayer, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. When he returned to his disciples, he found them asleep. <laughs> he said to Peter, So you could not keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Withdrawing a second time, he prayed again, My father, if it is not possible that this cup pass without my drinking it, your will be done. Then he returned once more and found them asleep, for they could not keep their eyes open. He left them and withdrew again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing again. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand when the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinners. Get up. Let's go. Look, my betrayer is at hand. So as we reflect upon this scripture, we observe Jesus asking his disciples to keep watch and to pray, but they fall asleep. Jesus then asked them, so you could not keep watch with me for one hour? What meaning might this question have to us? Well, he's asking us to spend time with him, plain and simple. And, and, and he wants us to spend time with him. Uh, there's disappointment in his voice there. He knows what's going to happen. And the, the disciples probably were afraid also and tired and just did not have the courage nor the strength to stay awake. Yeah, I think one of the, the telling statements that is that is made here is the flesh is willing or no, I get that backward. The spirit is willing, <laughs> but the flesh is weak. And sometimes that's what we have to take into account for ourselves as well. Um, is that we, we find ourselves tiring because of our body, not always because of our mind. But again, if we ask in prayer for that, that strength, if you will, then again, we will allow the Holy Spirit to guide us in, in our priorities, uh, as well as guiding us in how we should take care of ourselves so that we have more strength <laughs> within the body, uh, if you will. I, I think, too, that um, we kind of, we don't really know the pow complete power of the Eucharist in adoration. I know that there was once a um, quite a anti-Catholic, uh, atheistic uh, communist who happened to be walking down uh, the street in Paris on the side of Notre Dame Cathedral and it started raining 
And he went inside of the cathedral to get out of the rain, and they were having adoration. And that's all it took to uh, turn him around. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that sort of speaks to us as to the graces that are there and available to each of us um, uh, when we uh, take time to do that. And it doesn't have to be a long time. I think even spending uh, a short amount of time is uh, beneficial as well. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, there there is an opportunity. So, so let's like say we have never been to adoration before, and we've either been invited by a family member or a friend, or we simply make the decision to seek out time to spend an adoration of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. We find an opportunity, we protect our time and our calendar so we don't face any conflicts. So we're there, now what? What might we do during our time in adoration? Well, some people take it as an opportunity to uh, study the scriptures slowly. You can read the scriptures slowly um, in a prayerful mode. Sometimes you can say particular prayers that are meant for adoration. Um, some people like a, a cycle of prayers that uh, may, may include um, adoration and then maybe uh, some intentions of one's own uh, for oneself or one's family, then some quiet time, and then some time of thanksgiving before they leave. There's particular prayer books that separate an hour out into 15 minutes, each of those. But if someone is less regulated in their spirituality, they can just uh, sit and just uh, pay attention, really not to have any thought at all. That was common of the um, Rhineland mystics, John Towler, Meister Eckhart, and Henry Suso, all of whom are Dominicans, uh, they had a um, what's called a negative spirituality where you just kind of allow God to speak to you rather than you being the protagonist of the situation. We're always chatty <laughs> So, um, yes, yeah, so there's different ways according to your spirituality, um, how you feel that you can, or you can just simply sit there and just talk like you would to somebody you know um so and it depends on um you know how you're feeling as well so uh anything goes basically um there because there is no set format to adoration and that freedom is also a very good um way to nurture our relationship with god because it's not a um, quite as structured. We can be more uh, um, self-expressive of our own selves in that situation. You know, that, you know uh, uh, I saw on the, the Internet um, an article that says 48 things you can do during, during adoration. So it's, it's like there, there is no one specific thing, uh, if you will, um, and, but the focus, one of the, the things we need to remember, though, is, is that when we do these things, the focus is our Lord and Savior. It's an opportunity to, to spend our time with him. So, of course, one of the things we should remember during adoration is reverence as we enter uh, during our time with him as well as when we leave. But uh, a, a lot of people... Um, individually or maybe even in a group will we'll take the time to pray the rosary, for example. Um, it, and it, this kind of brings up that, uh, well, if, if we're there in a group, do we, all have, do we have to remain silent? It, if everybody agrees, saying the rosary during adoration is perfectly acceptable. Um, we may find it an opportunity to even maybe even sing a, sing a hymn. Um, and if we aren't very good at singing, it's an opportunity to remind uh, God of one of the gifts that he did give us. But, you know, it's, uh, 
singing a hymn is a form of prayer. And so again, if everybody is agreeable there, because some people may, may come and, and, and a portion of the time may be dedicated to pure silence so that everybody can focus, focus their thoughts. But particularly as, um, uh, at certain times during adoration, though, uh, the people may be invited to, to join in the hymn or, for example, saying the rosary or praying a litany uh, along the way. And usually when that happens, it's, um, there's some sort of written reference there for people to use, particularly when they're praying a litany uh, along the way, or someone will say the litany and all you have to do is follow along. So it's not, it's not really hard. We shouldn't be intimidated when we go in that we're, particularly if you're a new Catholic, I'm, I know when I was in that boat as a, as a new Catholic, I always, I always felt uh, a, a little awkward and, and um uh, and and kind of felt like I just didn't know what to say or do. I was always afraid of doing the wrong thing, but I also learned real quick. I, if I just followed along, I was pretty well okay uh, along the way. I might add mm-hmm. just a short PS that mm-hmm. it it is a good thing probably to consider to do for Lent as a Lenten practice mm-hmm. or as well. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. And as you mentioned, you know, last time we talked about prayer and we talked about using a prayer journal. This is a great place um, to, to be able to use a prayer journal. It's not the place to do your grocery list, you know, but uh, what you, again, the, the focus is, is on Jesus. And so taking that time to write him a letter um, or, or even write down what you feel he's saying to your heart. It's an opportunity to have a conversation with Jesus. So, again, just as we mentioned last time when we talked about prayer, we can bring to him our concerns. What are our plans? What are our joys? Uh, And also it's an opportunity to to have a conversation with him about where we need forgiveness and where we might be able to do better in our lives. But it's also a time for us to listen. And and as Sarah mentioned earlier, to, to try to empty our mind, if we will, um, so that we can hear him within our heart and hear him speaking within our heart, so listening for him within our heart. Um, and that's one of the reasons why during adoration, usually it's a, a quiet, reserved time. But as I also mentioned, it doesn't always have to be quiet because the people can lift up their prayers uh, in hymns or by collectively praying the rosary. Yeah, yeah, I would assume though that people would would want to be very careful and to not inter- to not do this if they sense that others are wanting silence. I kind of w- would think that that the silence would be the priority, and if everyone there is in agreement, and often since adoration will last in many places, several hours, uh, you could pick the time when when it is appropriate and then at other times when it isn't appropriate. Uh, just yeah. being a, very much aware in the spirituality of those around you. And if you're lucky enough to have a parish nearby that has perpetual adoration, which means that... Um, is the Blessed Sacrament is exposed 24-7 for people to come and pray, you may find yourself the only person there. And at that point, if there is no one else, then you you have a wide open range of, of choices of, of if you want to pray out loud to him, if you want to sing uh, through a hymn with him, if you want to pray the rosary uh, out loud. If you're the only one there, you're not disturbing anyone else. Um, and you're certainly not disturbing Jesus. But if others are there and they're looking for that, that quiet to, to focus, we, have, we do need to take that into account. And, of course, adoration, because of the respect uh, in that place and space, uh, is usually a quiet time. Uh, unless those, as I mentioned, unless those present uh, decide to lift up their prayers to him in the form of a hymn or a litany or, or praying the rosary together. And, of course, young children are full of energy and can be a disruption. So what should we do if we have children? 
Well, if if they're not in the mood, you probably ought not. If, if anybody else is in there, being respectful of other people is something that uh, the the parent needs to be. Where you know, this is not the time to discipline your children when other people are wanting silence. But if your children are well enough be, behaved and can go in there and be quiet, this is a wonderful opportunity for the children and for their spirituality too. Well, I think uh, it depends on the age level of the child. Um, as Helen mentioned, sometimes certain ages can be diff- difficult to handle uh, or, you know, depending on the maturity of your child, um, you know, you could bring something for them to uh, work on uh, either writing or drawing or that can be very profitable to them. Um, And, you know, even if they fall asleep or if we fall asleep, Mm -hmm. we shouldn't feel guilty because, as St. Therese said, you know, God doesn't get angry with that for us because you, you wouldn't get angry at your child who fell, fell asleep for <laughs> no reason. That's just a part of human life, you know, to look at a, a, a sleeping uh, child. So it's not that they're intentionally being irreverent, but um, but uh, I think it can be very beneficial to the child, too. It's something that they can remember later on in their life. Um, they might not appreciate it at the moment, but maybe later down the line, with their own struggles in life, they can remember that and, and utilize that tool for themselves. And, but also the children of Fatima, uh, uh, Francisco was a very um, uh, adoring child. What can I say? He spent a lot of time in church. So um, that those child, the children of Fatima were very um, rooted in ad- adoration as well. So uh, it's, it, uh, I don't think we can bar children from it because obviously there have been cases where um, they've been very devoted to it, but you just have to use your own judgment as a parent. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, I, having children, you wouldn't want to say we're going to spend an hour here. Uh, it probably be, would be more, a child would be more impressed for just a short few minutes to 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 say a prayer to Jesus and tell Jesus how much you love him. And, and, and enjoy that little bit of silence and then leave and, and let that be a time that, although brief, would be very, there would be an impression left that would be good. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's important to expose our children to adoration. And, of course, as, as uh, was mentioned there, we do have to consider the, the age of our children. And, um, and what I mean by that is more along the lines of, of as we protect the children, as we bring them in, as Helen mentioned, we don't have to feel like we have to stay, spend a full hour or, or the, the entire time there. Um, but I do think it's important that we expose children to it because I, I think it, if, even if they, they cry out uh, while in adoration, it is an opportunity that maybe we, we do take a break. It's okay to, to take a break, to take them you know, to, to the back um, if, if there's something that we need to tend to with them. You know, very young children, um, we, we don't always have the same choices we have with older children, to be quiet. You know, but still, it's important that they're there. Jesus wants to go from them as well. Um, he wants them to be there with him. He said, suffer the children to come in unto me. So, um, I remember, especially in my own life, that uh, when I was visiting with my family at the monastery and one of the outside sisters was trying to entertain my niece and nephew who were very young, and it was getting time for prayer, and um, she brought them in and just said, 
she sat them down in the front pew and, and just said, well, there's Jesus up there who was exposed in the Blessed Sacrament at the time. And all I remember is going in and seeing them sitting in the front pew with their mouths open <laughs> as if they'd seen uh, something from Star Wars or something. So they can be really impressed, yes. Yeah. And so, again, we do have to keep in mind their age, um, but we can let them know that they have an opportunity to visit with Jesus. Uh, we can also engage them in praying with us. Uh, and, and as Sarah mentioned, you know, we can bring an age-appropriate prayer book or, or a scriptural coloring book for, for the, uh, the younger children. Uh, and as Helen mentioned, we do have to consider their attention span. So a lesser time in adoration is better than no time uh, at all. Um, we also don't want to turn adoration into something that the kids go, oh my gosh, are we up at all? They want, we want them to be able to feel excited about the fact that we get to go visit Jesus. And so it, it is okay to, to, to take a break. And as we grow older and as the children grow older, we're able to maybe spend more time, maybe more quietly. We do want to be rever- uh, consider those who, who are around us. Um, but those also who are around those who bring their children, we want to feel encouraged when someone brings their children to adoration because that's the future of our faith. And we should be encouraged because our children are being exposed to the faith. Um, and that's we also want to encourage um, you know, uh, young parents to, to bring their children, uh, fathers and mothers. Um, we, we don't want to scold them if a child cries out. Um, we'll leave that to Jesus as far as um, uh, and and I think I think he's excited to hear their voices. So we want to create a reverent environment. We want to teach our children to be reverent in that environment, but we also don't want to make that that opportunity to be there with Jesus to to seem like it's a a burden. Um, uh, and so it's it's a balance that that we're seeking there. But I think it's extremely important that we give our children the same opportunities that we should be giving ourselves to spend time with Jesus. So let's take a look at John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27, and it reads, Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. In this moment, we observe Mary at the foot of the cross, along with others who witnessed. We do not know the thoughts of Mary, but let's reflect a moment. What are our thoughts of this moment, and why do we think Mary was there? How might this touch our heart as we consider spending time with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament? Well, as I think Mary is considered the um, uh, epitome of um, the example of who we should be following as human beings um, because she was the most perfect disciple of Jesus, I think that it's the, we're the example of um what we should be doing. I think she spent a lot of time adoring her child. Uh, she was there with him a lot. And um, and Mary uh, at the foot of the cross, that was the probably the height of her own faith is that she stood by the foot of the cross when most of the other disciples either ran away or um, cowered in fear. So... Um, I think it's a sign of the strength of our faith, too, uh, which is rooted in the Incarnation and in our belief in uh, Jesus in the present and the Blessed Sacrament. So just as she is an example for us, um, especially, um, I think it is something that we ought to consider and um, follow as in our thoughts before the Blessed sacrament, but also in uh, our consideration of, you know, including adoration in our own spiritual life. Well, you know, I when I think of Mary at the foot of the cross, uh, it's not so much 
of an example as a comfort to so many mothers who have sat at the bedside of their own children who suffer, Um, because that's what mothers do. But Mary being at the foot of the cross, to me, has, has brought so much comfort to 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 people who are especially mothers but to fathers or or anyone who who is standing by and having to be part of the suffering of someone they love uh mary is, is such a comfort because you know she knows exactly what you what you're feeling and what your pain is In quotes, I'd like to leave you. St. Teresa of Lisieux said, Heaven for me is hidden in a little host where Jesus, my spouse, is veiled for love. I go to that divine furnace to draw out life, and there my sweet Savior listens to me night and day. St. Alphonsus de la Gorge, uh, said, Good friends, find pleasure in one another's company. Let us know pleasure in the company of our best friend, a friend who can do everything for us, a friend who loves us beyond measure. Here in the Blessed Sacrament, we can talk to him straight from the heart. So some final thoughts. Some are tempted to believe that adoration is only for those in the religious life, for those who are more pious than we, whatever that might mean. Others might express that they would consider spending time in adoration, but there always seems to be a conflict, something to do, somewhere else to be. Whatever the excuse we might have, we should take a moment to consider Who is the happiest when we are unable to attend? The evil one will be ecstatic to help us find an excuse for us to spend time elsewhere, anywhere, but in adoration of our Lord and Savior. I must admit, the first time I spent in adoration of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, I was awkward. I didn't really know what to do or think. I didn't feel it was right for me, such an accomplished sinner, if you will, to be there. I had feelings that I was somehow intruding in a sacred space meant for others. It certainly was not a space meant for me, a wretched sinner. My life was the life of a centurion. Certainly no one, anyone would call a religious man. I knew I was not worthy to enter under his roof, but he still invited me in. In my mind, I felt I should only approach him from afar. The walls did not shake and thunder did not sound in protest of my presence. Instead, I found a moment of peace. I'm still not worthy to enter under his roof, but he still invites me in. He wants our time. He wants our love. He wants a relationship with us. He is there waiting. The choice is to the time we spend with him. He has left to us. Well, speaking of time, at least for this hour, it has come to an end. And we hope you'll be able to join us next week as we continue our discussion of what God asks of us as we turn our attention to the Mass. Let us conclude with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open and discuss your Holy Word. We pray that as we go our separate ways, you will continue to walk with us and help us to see how we may put on the armor of truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the Word of the Gospel, not only for the benefit of our lives, but also the lives of all who cross our path. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you all, and God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.